Uh, I also want to welcome everyone here, and I want to thank all of you again for taking time out of your busy lives. Uh, you know, in this world of uh, Zooming and live streaming and all this and that, there's a sort of a temptation to sit in our rooms and just, uh, just watch things on a screen. Well, we weren't designed that way as human beings. We're social animals, and it's very important, in my opinion, uh, for us to get together physically. As, uh, as my colleague Chris said, get to know each other, uh, make contacts. We've had friendships made uh, through our events that have lasted for years, and we're happy about that. So getting together is so important, and we thank you for doing that. Um, I do want to also riff a little bit on the Rockwell theme, because I discovered Lou Rockwell. All roads lead to, Ru to Lou, I think. Um, I discovered Lou Rockwell through the late Justin Raimondo. I was living in Hungary at the time, watching as the Yugoslav War, which is now just past a quarter century old, was brewing on the horizon. And I had spent time in the Balkans, and I knew what a disaster it was going to be. Uh, and I discovered antiwar.com. And through that, I discovered lewrockwell.com. And through that, I discovered Ron Paul. So uh, all roads led to, to Lou. And Lou, uh, again, was one of the first people that published my work back in the US in the late 90s. And I was very happy to see my name in print and to have some articles being written about things that I was experiencing in the Balkans and in Central Europe uh, to bringing it to the audience of lewrockwell.com. Now, I got home in uh, 2000 after about a decade overseas. Uh, and I was a little naive about Washington, DC. Um, I was opposed to NATO expansion at the time. I lived through it in Hungary, and I thought it was a terrible mistake. Uh, so I got on at a think tank in DC that also opposed NATO expansion. But it turns out that it was a neocon think tank run by neocons. And so I was so thrilled at getting published that I would run through the halls saying, I got my article on lewrockwell.com. And so I very soon after that had a performance review where I was informed that I was to be let go. <laughs> We're moving in different directions than you're moving. <laughs> so, uh, so that was actually the best thing that ever happened to me. And I've told the story before, because, because of that, I was able to go work in Dr. Paul's congressional office. So there's always a silver lining in the dark cloud of being fired. <laughs> so, um, so how about that Speaker Johnson? <laughs> How about Mike Johnson? Yesterday, as Thomas Massey tweeted out on Twitter X, was a sad day for America. And that is absolutely correct. Mike Johnson actually engineered, engineered the passage of the Section 702 extension for two more years. It would have not have happened had he not personally become involved met with the White House and engineered the passage. What does Section 702 do? It's rather complicated, but to simplify it, and many of you do know it, it means that if the federal government is interested in somebody who is a foreign national, they can listen into that person's communications without a warrant. But not only that, they can listen to anyone else that that person talks to, be he or she an American citizen, without a warrant. So that's why you saw the, if you get a phone call from, uh, from your friend in Germany, what have you, uh, they can just hoover up everything uh, that you have uh, about you. So it's an insidious, insidious section. And where did it come out? How was it historically formed? Well, like all terrible things, it's the product of government reform. <laughs> you know, there was, <laughs> there was a, um, in 2007, an article came out in the New York Times uh, detailing how after 9-11, the government had used the Patriot Act, I know it will shock some of you, but used the Patriot Act to spy on all of us. It was only supposed to be for the terrorists. But no, they were spying on all of us. So there was an outcry, if you remember, back in 07, and the government got together and was feeling a little bit of heat. So they said, Let's reform this. <laughs> Let's reform this. So in 2008, there were the FISA Amendments Act were passed, and that was a reform of FISA. And that was supposed to improve it. But of course, it just helped facilitate more spying 
on Americans. It just kind of quieted them down to stop being frustrated about it. Well, what happened in 2013? A fellow by the name of Ed Snowden blew the whistle and said, guess what, guys, they are still spying on you. They are sucking up everything without warrants, and they are uh, basically treating us as the terrorists. Well, what happened to Ed Snowden? We all know what happened to Ed Snowden. But what did they do after that? They felt the heat again. So they passed more reform. Remember the Freedom Act. This is going to take care of it. Don't worry about it. Well, what the Freedom Act did was make legal the things that were illegal, part of the Patriot Act. And that's how government reform works. Um, so this is uh, sort of the backstory of what happened yesterday. So this was supposed to sunset. And of course, when Dr. Paul was hesitant on the Hill, uh, not hesitant, he just outright said, no for this Patriot Act, it's garbage, it's anti-American. Well, a lot of other members were also felt the same way. They said, don't worry, it's got a sunset. We're only, like, we are in a crisis. We are getting attacked. Do you want another building takedown? It's only gonna be for a couple years. It'll sunset. Well, of course, it has been now 25 years, nearly. Uh, and it just keeps coming up again. It's an automatic, automatic reboot. Well, it was scheduled to sunset finally on, October, or on uh, April 19th, just coming up in about a week. So there's been a, you know, <laughs> there was a mad scurry, a mad rush. What are we gonna do? We can't let this, we can't let, you know, freedom and constitutionality come back. So the idea is that uh, Speaker Johnson heralded, uh, husbanded us uh, the, the reauthorization. But there was a rebellion in the House this year, and it's led by people like Thomas Massey, who we all know, Thomas Massey's on the, on the board of the Rump Institute as well, a great hero. Um, others who are sometimes friends of ours, like Marjorie Taylor Greene, and sometimes not so much. There was an amendment that was allowed to the floor, and that amendment said, okay, you're gonna be spying on these foreigners, which they shouldn't do anyway, but you're gonna to have to get a warrant if you wanna spy on Americans. You can't just automatically suck up all their stuff. So that was, it. That was, uh, that was good that they at least had the amendment on it. But if, if you were following what happened yesterday, that amendment went down to a tie. The tie was broken by Speaker Johnson. Speaker Johnson voted no, you don't have to get a warrant to spy on Americans. So he broke that, it's very uncommon for a speaker to vote. Uh, the speaker of the House doesn't vote very often, only when it's very important. So he felt obviously this was important enough to step down and vote to deny us our due process before we're spied on. So he facilitated, Johnson facilitated a full court press. Jake Sullivan, our illustrious national security advisor, Merrick Garland, that great, uh, uh, <laughs> that great proponent of justice, they worked the phones to members constantly. National security, national security, national security, are you with the terrorists? The Department of Homeland Security, the CIA, and the Department of Justice literally had representatives at the floor to the floor, at the door of the floor of the house, standing there just waiting for members to come by. And they also set up a SCIF, a Sensitive Compartmentalized Intelligence Facility, right by the door so they could usher you in, okay, we're gonna tell you some secrets, uh, this is why you have to pass this. This is why you have to. This is why you have to reauthorize it. National security. National security. Now I have a quote from Speaker Johnson when he was interviewed uh, about this because he had been opposed to it, or so he said, opposed to the extension of this. So someone asked him, "Well, you were against this. You spoke out against it, kind of like how we spoke out against aid to Ukraine." Um, and they said, "Well, what's, what's it all about? Now you made it happen." This is a great quote. I mean, this, I think, is government in a nutshell. He said, Speaker Mike Johnson, when I was a member of the Judiciary Committee, I saw the abuses of the FBI, hundreds of thousands of abuses. And then I became Speaker, and I got the confidential briefing to understand how important it is for national security. <laughs> so he knew the FBI was doing horrifically inappropriate, illegal things. But when they brought him into the skiff and said, let me show you this stuff, well, then he changed his mind. And it reminded me of a story of our, our great, uh, sadly deceased friend, Walter Jones, Representative Walter Jones from North Carolina. Because you all know the story of Walter Jones. He was a very conservative, very hawkish Republican 
from a district with a very large military base, Camp Lejeune, in it. Uh, so he was kind of a garden variety, right-wing, pro-war Republican. And he went to all of those briefings in the skiffs in the lead up to the Iraq war. He listened to everything they told him. They, you know, spread out maps and things with all kinds of stamps on it. You know, no foreign, confidential, NC, whatever. And he listened to it and he believed them. And he voted for the war. And then he realized something. He came to realize they lied to me. They completely lied. Everything they said was a pack of lies. And when he realized that, he made it his purpose, his singular purpose in life for the rest of his life to try to make amends for what he had done. Because he knew that a lot of young men and probably women were sent to their deaths because he helped these liars facilitate their lies because they wanted a war on Iraq. So he physically, personally, by hand, I believe, wrote letters to the families of every single fallen service member in the Iraq war, apologizing for the role that he played. And I remember he had a display in front of his office of all the fallen soldiers. That's how much it upset him. And everyone knows that was the case because almost every time he went to the floor, he would bring it up. He would often bring it up. They lied to me. They used intelligence to manipulate me into the war vote that they wanted. And Speaker Johnson must have known this, right? That they lie and they lie constantly. He knew it and it didn't bother him. As Massey said afterwards, he said, this is how the Constitution dies, and that is a fact. So we're here to talk about the subtitle, The End of Truth in America. And I've mentioned this before in a speech, but the most famous, at least to me, mention of the word truth is when Jesus was brought before Pilate, and Pilate said, what is truth? And it was I think, a very fascinating moment uh, in, in history, in the trial of, of, of Jesus. What is truth? Well, we ask the question ourselves too. Truth? What is truth? Well, truth is revealed to us by God, if you believe that, but also through study, through reflection, through, uh, through reading, through communicating. That's how we get to the truth. But the government, of course, wants to manipulate how we process information so that we get to the truth that they want us to get to. That's why you have someone like Fauci who said, I am the science. Because they want you to come to their conclusions, not your own conclusion. So you cannot, we cannot reach uh, the truth in life without the ability to freely peruse. This is what the United States is all about. This is why we have a First Amendment. They cannot. They do not have the power to limit our access to anything or our ability to communicate in any way we want to do. But they are doing their best, of course, to manipulate that. And we saw this with the uh, Twitter files. When we realized that the government was colluding with social media companies to ban people who were saying inconvenient truths, like, oh, the vax doesn't work, you know? Um, things like this would get you banned. Um, and they did it across the board for everything, not just that. Uh, a lot of conservatives, a lot of progressives who challenged the warfare state were banned and censored. So they do not like us to get to the objective truth about things. And so that is the case with something that has really been bothering me for a few weeks now. And that is the House passage of the TikTok ban. You know, and you might say, come on, man, that's for kids. But guess what? It's not for kids. As I wrote in an, uh, an update for the Ron Paul Institute called the TikTok Totalitarians, I believe that the attempted ban, and it may go through the Senate, the Senate hasn't picked it up yet, I think it's worse than the Patriot Act, believe it or not. Uh, because it's essentially, a, 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 the idea is to manipulate how you can think, what you can see, what you can read. It's not just spying on Americans, it's changing your software up here. Because if you can't see any of this stuff over here, like, oh, the vax doesn't work, if you can't see any of that, then your truth is that it does work. Oh, war is good. Oh, those Chicoms are out for our precious bodily fluids. So if you can't access, if you can't access alternative information, then you can't come to the truth. You can't seek the truth. Now, Glenn Greenwald wrote about the TikTok ban, and he has a good quote that I'd like to read, because I think he, as usual, in fact, he spoke to the Mises conference here, last time I think we were here. He said, the TikTok bill 
is how rights erosions always, always, always work. Pick a target to start with that everyone hates or fears so that everyone unites in support. Nobody wants to defend. Then the precedent is set. So when it expands inward, nobody can object any longer. So, of course, that's what they did with TikTok. It's owned by the Chicoms. Didn't you guys know this? We've got to stop it. Um, and I, 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 I think there are, I, I call it a quadruple threat. There are four very, very, very bad things about the attempt to ban TikTok. The first is the Red Scare aspect. And I'm going to read uh, a quote from Peter Van Buren, who spoke to our Houston conference, I think, last year, uh, who's a good friend of ours. Um, he has a good quote ex uh, 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 explaining the Red Scare aspect. So he said, the House recently passed a bill, H.R. 7521, seeking to ban the popular app TikTok from America's smartphones. The logic works like this. TikTok is owned by a Chinese company. Chinese companies are under the control of the Chinese communists. Therefore, TikTok is brainwashing American youth while at the same time gathering their personal data for some undefined yet assumed nefarious use. Thus, TikTok should be banned. And that is the logic in total. They don't explain any of it. Peter goes on to say, no evidence has been presented of any of the assertions listed. No evidence the Chinese government exerts control over TikTok, whose contents are 100% user created. No evidence the app has any purpose other than to make money. And no evidence the app collects data and uses it in some way. Nefarious or not, it just feels scary bad, like any other red scare. And so the House moved to ban it. The Senate votes soon, and Joe Biden says he'll sign it if it comes to him. So the red scare aspect, the Chinese are going to steal data about our kids. They're going to steal data about the users. And the U.S. government says, hey, hold on, that's our job. <laughs> You're encroaching on our territory here. Um, the other part of it is the attack on the First Amendment. And this is the, really the insidious nature of this bill, if you read it. And Thomas Massey, again, did a great job of reading and analyzing the bill. He, I think, probably is one of two members up there who actually do read things and think about them. Uh, but the attack on the First Amendment, um, and, and Peter again talks about it, Section 2A1 of the bill, prohibits any foreign adversary controlled application, FACA, from operating in the US. It applies not only to the app itself, the TikTok app, it applies to the websites, it applies to the, uh, it applies to the um, internet service provider as well. It prohibits foreign adversary controlled applications from the US. It is essentially a government kill switch. The government has the ability to flip it off. You can't go to this website. I thought that's what we had to complain about the Chinese in the first place and the Iranians, whatever. They're flipping off websites. You can't look at this. You can't go here. Well, this is exactly what it is. The reality is we can read anything we want. We can consume any kind of media we want. Uh, we can consume foreign propaganda. We can spend all day watching press TV if we want. It's okay. We're allowed to. And there was a, test, there was a case back in the 60s, Lamont versus Postmaster, Postmaster, that came to this conclusion. You can, you can consume propaganda if you want. In fact, myself, I, I subscribed to Soviet life in the 80s. I thought it was interesting, you know. Uh, you're allowed to do that until now, until they tried to, to ban it. Now, the third threat is the government executive branch power grab. And this is serious because what is a foreign adversary controlled application? Well, the president decides who the adversaries are. There are some basic criteria, but they're very fungible, I think. But it allows the president to, to determine if any website, any application for your phone or computer presents a significant threat to the national security of the United States, according to the bill. Peter Van Buren explains the term controlled by a foreign adversary means that the company A is domiciled or headquartered or organized under the laws of a foreign adversary country 
or has a 20% ownership from one of those countries and is it subject to the direction or control of a foreign person. Who determines that? The president does. Right now we have in our books, uh, the, our foreign adversaries are like Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, and probably Cuba, what have you. But that can change. Uh, as as, as, as uh, Peter Van Buren mentioned, France was our adversary when it didn't want to go to war against Iraq. Uh, tomorrow it could be another country, a different country. But even if it is just these countries, uh, how many times had, did we hear over the Trump period that he was controlled by a foreign adversary? He's controlled by Russia. Uh, what about the Ron Paul Liberty Report? We, didn't buy the, uh, we don't buy the, uh, the war propaganda. We, cri we, we, we criticize what they're saying about Ukraine on a, almost a daily basis. They could certainly make a case that we're foreign adversary controlled. We're, we hear it all the time. He's using Putin's talking points, uh, everyone they don't like. So the slippery slope here to give the president the power to A, determine who the foreign adversaries are and to determine whether your website is controlled directly or indirectly. You know, you know, you have to get a phone call from Putin. Hey, can you put this up on your website? You don't have to do that. You know, it can be indirect. Well, we can tell these are the talking points. You're using these talking, talking points. So it's, it's an extraordinarily dangerous move. So that's number three. And number four, it's a mafia move, an absolute mafia move. And you guys probably noticed this, but the, it wasn't just that TikTok was going to get banned. They say, well, here's a way out, guys. You can sell it. You can sell part of it. So as soon as, as, soon as you talk about banning this company, profitable company, make a lot of money, what's going to happen to the stock prices? <laughs> You know, the government's gonna come in and shut you down. The value of your, of your property, the value of your company goes way down. So, Deep State Mnuchin came in, if you remember, and said, hmm, I've got a consortium together. We, we, we might wanna buy this thing, you know? Of course, it's a mafia move. It's the government holding a gun. And actually, when I wrote about it in my update for Ron Paul Institute supporters, I, I, I remembered a scene from The Godfather, if you remember, when Michael was talking to Kay. And he was talking about how uh, Johnny Fontaine, the singer, needed to get out of his contract because he was going to hit the big time. And Michael explained to Kay that, um, that uh, my father <laughs> sent Luca Brazzi <laughs> to the band leader and said, either your signature or your brains are going to be on this contract. And that's essentially what the government is doing with TikTok. Uh, your signature or your brains are going to be on this contract to sell to Steve Mnuchin and his consortium. So the, um, the danger, of course, of this, again, coming back to how we started, is seeking truth. Uh, now, I don't use TikTok, but a lot of people do. They get information from it. But if we are to be kept from reading whatever we want, watching press TV, watching RT, till the cows come home, then we're never going to be able to arrive at truth. And let's just look at a few examples that are important that at first most people didn't understand and then they came to know. The Iraq war, we talked about it when we started. They lied through their teeth constantly, but it came out, the truth came out eventually. Now, if the government had its way, it would have prevented that truth from coming out, we would never would have known. Said, so thank God we got rid of those dumb EMDs. But the Arab Spring, some of you follow that. That was fake, that was a Hillary job. Right? They didn't all jump up and start screaming for democracy. No, that was, that was a setup. Libya. No, Gaddafi was not handing out Viagra. Um, that was just an excuse to get people excited and to be happy about him being murdered, which is what happened. And the country destroyed, and it's destroyed to this day. It was a, once a beautiful country. Doesn't matter if you like Gaddafi or not. It's a beautiful country. It was the most advanced country in Africa. Gone. It'll never return. Afghanistan. 20 years. 20 years in Afghanistan. We didn't, build, we didn't build a good country there, guys. You know, as Dr. Paul mentioned a couple of weeks ago in his column, you know, we spent 20 years replacing the Taliban with the Taliban. So that was great. We never would have known that if it weren't for access to information the government doesn't want you to have. And the, the one that would be in our headlines today would be Israel. We wouldn't know what really happened uh, since October 7th if we weren't able to access things. And that, ironically, is how I will close. Because one of the complaints about TikTok 
uh, and there was an overheard conversation, a recorded conversation from the head of the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League. He said, we got a TikTok problem. Young people are watching TikTok videos and they're not buying the propaganda line. They're skeptical. They think there's something more to this. And we've talked about it on the show as well. Among young people, the view of what's happening in the Middle East has radically changed. Uh, there's a lot more uh, openness. There's a lot more of an idea that maybe we shouldn't be so involved. Maybe we shouldn't uh, be so dedicated to one ally that we would risk taking our entire country to war. Well, a lot of kids, guess what? They're not tuning into MSNBC. They're not putting on CNN. They're going to TikTok and they're hearing videos. They're watching things that appeal to them in their own way. And they're coming to diff different conclusions. And that is a threat to the government. The government does not want that. Special interests do not want that. So that is why, the real reason I believe, that TikTok is about to be banned. So I would just close by saying we are all on a search, on a journey toward the truth. Uh, we'll never arrive there completely, but we're on a journey. And that journey depends on us being able to take whatever curly cues that we need to take through life to get to something that makes sense. And the government is determined to get between us and the truth. Thank you very much.